What a place this is. God knows what things have happened here and gone unrecorded by men, or are on the way towards us. Will we ever know the true history of it? The secret history, stored away in the dark folds of the landscape, in its scattered bones of a paradise found or lost. And when we talk about history, of course what history really is, is what is told and recorded. Um, but of course what is told and recorded is only the smallest part of what happens. And you know, when we talk, for example, about 40,000 years of Aboriginal history in Australia, almost none of that is recorded, but a great deal happened. And it seems to me that fiction is always interested in all those parts of life, of ordinary lives, uh, and there are many, many of those uh, that never gets into the history books. They're not involved with large events at all. They're involved with the ordinary mundane things of living from day to day. And fiction therefore tells a different story from the story that gets into history. It's a story that allows people to enter into what happened imaginatively, the way large events may not. He was speaking of poetry itself, of the hidden part it played in their lives, how it spoke up for what is deeply felt and might otherwise go unrecorded. All those unique and repeatable events, the little sacraments of daily existence, movements of the heart and intimations of the close but inexpressible grandeur and terror of things, that is our other history. one that goes on in a quiet way under the noise and chatter of events and speaks immediately out of the centre of each one of us. Giving shape to what we too have experienced and did not till then have words for. Though as soon as they are spoken, we know them as our own. One day before publication, Thank you. David Malouf is one of the world's leading contemporary writers. He's published eight novels, five collections of poetry, a collection of short stories and two libretti. He's won numerous prestigious literary awards, including a shortlisting for the Booker Prize in 1995, and in Dublin recently his novel Remembering Babylon was judged the best book by anyone, anywhere, in any language in the last three years. The winner of the 1996 International Impact Dublin Literary Award is the man we have all come here to honor tonight, David Malouf. A sorrowful land, with the fine rain thin as smoke blowing in from the Atlantic so that the taste of it was there on your lip. The smell of it in sheets that had been laid over a bush to dry. Salt and sorrow over the fields. A sad country, mournful made human by the long sorrows it had endured. The sorrows yet to come. I think that there are five or six people writing in English now who are still writing novels, who are not producing blueprints for movie scripts. I suppose they are um, Tony Morrison, V.S. Naipaul, Nadine Gordimer, J.M. Coetzee, John McGahern, and 
I certainly think that David Maloof is among that group of very special novelists left in the world now, still writing novels where, where the language is beautiful, where the characterization is superb, which, which, which are mysterious still in their shape, which are not led by politics or ideas, but are led by the, the sense of character and the sense of form. And certainly as a reader, anything that those five or six novelists would produce would be fascinating now. These are books which where the, the intimacy of the relationships between the two people is sometimes so magical that you don't want to leave these people in the novel. You want to take them home. You know, I think that's, that's what's... Uh, and when, when you find a writer who can do that to you, you know, as a reader, it's, you know, gold. The thing about Malou's imagination is we'd all like to have it. That's the secret. <laughs> he uh, doesn't seem to forget anything. He's got a great gift of, of, uh, of assessing the actual tone and rhythm of speech. And he's, he's inward with the English language in the most extraordinary way, as if, he was, as if he was reinventing it. And without too many verbal quirks. I mean, he's not a Joycean writer in that way. The words, the words are what they always were, just the combinations are, are unique. It's the Maloufian stamp. And uh, it's when a writer uh, is actually characteristic for us in simply the way he lays out a sentence that he starts becoming a classic, in my view. Well, this is uh, the city I was born and grew up in. I lived here until I was 25 when I ran away to Europe. Uh, but it's a city that I hardly recognize now. Part of you is still wandering around in that lost city, that um, submerged city. And I mean, an awful lot of your emotions are involved with um, meetings you had at particular street corners, times when you waited hours for people who didn't turn up at particular street corners. Uh, so, so that city is a map of, of your experience, is a map of your emotions, as well as everything else. And uh, if you're a writer, that's what you're continually going back to. And so you, you, the emotions are still recoverable. Uh, the city's recoverable only, really, in, uh, in memory. Uh, I have a very, very good memory, which is photographic uh, to the extent that I see what I'm remembering very, very clearly. Uh, it's also inaccurate. And, uh, I mean, I quite like the fact that um, you have an an inaccurate memory, which is also very, very visually clear. First houses are the grounds of our first experience. A complex history comes down to us through household jokes and anecdotes, odd habits, irrational superstitions, its spirit resides in ordinary objects that become, beyond the fact of presence and usefulness, the characters in a private language, characters too in the story we are living. We hear our first folk tales with a start of recognition, since what is enacted in them is general to every society, even the smallest, and our own has already revealed to us the magic that glows along a threshold or round a forbidden biscuit tin. And my mother's parents were both uh, dead uh, when I was growing up, so I didn't know either of them, except from the rather grand photographs I was always shown of them, and from the stories my mother told. My mother, uh, who'd left England when she was 10, um, went on living in that English world she'd come out of. My father's parents came to Australia separately. They came from the same town, in fact, in Lebanon. I don't, don't ever remember him speaking any English. And uh, I used to be quite fascinated by the fact that he spoke another language. And he would often um, be telling long stories uh, to people who were sitting there and laughing. I've no idea what those stories were. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I used to sort of eavesdrop on them and felt that I understood what they were about because I could hear the tune. The old man's stories are fabulous beyond anything I have retold from the Greeks. But Savage, a form of extravagant play that explains nothing but speaks straight out of the nightmare landscape of this place and my dream journeys across it. They fill the world, they make the head buzz, they numb the blood. They seem absolutely true and yet they explain nothing. My, my father was a Roman Catholic and we were brought up as Catholics. I mean, he was very much a mother's boy. He um, bought a house that was two doors from his mother's. I mean, he lived with us, but his mail was always delivered at what he called down home, which was at his, at his mother's. He went down there every evening after he came back. I came home from work and spent at least an hour uh, with my grandmother. Um, my mother and my grandmother had a very, very um, shaky, not to say hostile, relationship. I, I don't ever remember that she ever um, crossed the threshold into our house. Uh, that area that people in Brisbane call under the house is something that's peculiar to the domestic architecture of this city. A lot of children found it a very scary place. I certainly did. Down here is the underside of things, the great wedge of air on which the house floats, ever darkness. The stumps of a forest of which the house, with its many rooms, forms the branches a place whose dimensions are measured not in ordinary feet and inches, but in heartbeats. Or the number of seconds you can endure the sticky, soft lash of cobwebs against your mouth. Or the weight of your body at kneecap and palm on crunchy cinders. It's mostly dark. Sometimes there's a tool shed under there. What's almost always under there is everything that has fallen out of the house. So, you know, endlessly as a child, if you had lost a bit of a jigsaw puzzle or a screw or a nail that you were particularly fond of, where you went and looked for it was under the house because it's probably fallen through the boards. Uh, it was also a place where you went to, to be alone, to sulk. Uh, also, it was a place where people went to experiment sexually. I mean, little, little boys and girls playing down there, that's where you found out an awful lot that... Um, that, that was possible in that space that wasn't possible up in the house. September the 3rd, 1939. Germany strikes, hurls total war upon Poland, and Britain is plunged into the inferno of the Second World War. The call goes into the far corners of the empire. It's the Can Call. A mighty empire of 500 million responds. We always listened to the uh, war news at home. It became a great... Um, feature of everybody's life. And I had an aunt who used to sort of come up and, you know, eight o'clock in the mornings, she'd be shouting at the bottom of the stairs, have you heard whatever it was? And um, the thing that I can remember very well is her coming up one morning and sort of shouting from the bottom of the stairs, Belgium's fallen. I had no idea what the fall of Belgium meant. It was a bit like Humpty Dumpty. And I remember going to school and I had a friend called John Malpas who was the same age and there were little tiny stools, only about four inches high, and I was sitting on one of these, and he came and sat behind, beside me and said, what's the matter? And I remember saying to him, haven't you heard Belgium's fallen? Uh, as if it was some sort of, um, as if it were part of a domestic crisis rather than anything else. When I crawled into bed at night and my father came to put out the light, the war took on its real form. Hitler and Mussolini, those historical bogeymen that even adults believed in, burst in upon me, bearing their terrible paraphernalia of barbed wire, bayonets, tin helmets, hand grenades. 
Their purpose, quite simply, to reach up over the foot of my bed or down over the pillow and drag me into the pallid black and white world of newspaper photographs and newsreels. A world without colour, like the night itself, in which everyone was a victim, pale, luminous, with flesh already frazzled around the edge, and where being a child with curly hair and apple cheeks that everyone wondered at was no protection at all. One of the most popular forms of entertainment in the, those years of the war were the newsreel theatrettes. Uh, they showed only war news. Uh, they ran, the program ran for about an hour. There was a huge turnover of people. But essentially, that notion of what war was like close up uh, came first with those newsreels. The year 1942 opened on a dismal note for the Allies. The troops in Malaya, including Australia's doomed 8th Division, hopelessly outnumbered and outgunned, had been pushed back onto the island of Singapore, there to surrender on the 15th of February. 140,000 enter captivity. 15,000 of these are Australians, and for a time they're held at Changi. In some camps, the prisoners are treated the reasonably. The rule, it seems, for the Japanese is that you, you, you never surrender and that once you have surrendered, you cease to be um, a human person. You needed to, f to be able to form uh, a little group of two or three if you were going to survive at all. You simply could not survive alone. They also survived by creating rituals for themselves that keep life going. That, that impose some kind of um, psychological order on life, on daily living, but also some kind of um, process of living still in the, in the imagination and in memory um, that keeps the two parts of your life connected, that keeps the present connected with the past. And of course, if you, if you believe that there's a connection between the present and the past, you can also believe that there's a connection between that present and a coming future. It was the names of all the girls they had done it with. The Muriels and Glorias and Pearls and Isabels going right back to when you were in sixth grade and first could. The names first, then the details. Where each one was, behind the baths or on a bench under a school somewhere or in the back of a park truck, and when on the Christmas holidays or on a Queen's birthday long weekend, what she had on, the shoes, if any, the bra and panties, the colour and pattern of her frock, and the sweat smell or the soap smell of what it had been washed in. Or the feel of leather, smooth or with seams, where it had stuck to your bare ass in the back of the Vox. And the taste of vanilla malted or popcorn in her mouth, or Wrigley spearmint, or the fried fat of chips. Ah, chips. Now that would be something. When you're writing about some situation, say, in a novel, um, you have something of your own experience to go on, uh, but often you have no direct experience at all of what now has to happen to the characters. And you have to imagine that. You have to use what you know of your own experience to project yourself into a situation you've never been in, uh, the skin of a person you've never been in. And um, you have to believe that that can be done. But once you've done it, you have actually been there. In 1956, Maloof graduated from Brisbane University with an honours degree in English and languages. He worked as a clerk and then as a part-time teacher and sank into a deep despondency. At weekends, I took my bike to the coast. Nothing extraordinary ever deigned to reveal itself to me. Several times I thought I was in love. Once, not so briefly, with a boy from Serena, and we spent a good deal of our time riding suicidally into the darkness off country roads, seeking some sort of romantic disillusion. What astonished me, I think, was to discover that I was entirely without ambition. I found no need in myself to succeed on these terms. I wasn't suffering, 
though I couldn't have been called happy. I was in good health, my life was easy, undemanding. I didn't even have the comfort of being a victim. I was simply immobilized from within. I came to England in 1959. England was actually really then still quite a grim place. And I taught in very, very poor parts of London. But it was also a great place. I mean, there were, there, there were wonderful concerts to go to. Uh, Theatre was exciting. There were a lot of new playwrights coming along. His work went, went to see. Intellectually, it was a very exciting place to come to. It was in London that Maloof met Carmen Khalil, a fellow Australian who became his publisher and remains one of his closest friends. Yeah. Palestine can be said to exist. And he, he's always hated that arrangement. But when I got the manuscript, I, I actually, she was going to edit it, and I did about four uh, When I became managing director of Chatter in 1982 or three, one or the other, I became his publisher. And, I um, thought he was a great writer from the first book of his that I read. Isn't that true? I don't know. I never knew he did. He often goes to Palestine. Or well, we talk to each other a lot about work, yes. I mean, on a professional level, as far as his work is concerned, I will occasionally complain or moan about something, but not a lot. What do you think? And we talk about... <clears throat> people. People. We <laughs> terrible gossips, both of us. He's a worse gossip because he's got a better memory. I'd be a better gossip if I could remember more. <laughs> he's got total recall. <laughs> Come on, Deb. Go and chase David. Don't do that, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you. I think we got quite drunk the very first night on, on some whiskey and then went off to dinner somewhere and um, I, 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 we hit it off right from the very beginning. I mean, Carmen is always so absolutely forthright. You always know absolutely where you stand. And I like that. I mean, I don't mind people telling me, now, darling, it's time to be quiet. I've got something to do. I mean, I, I think that's, you know, exactly where you stand always. I spent a bit of time in London and then took a job at Birkenhead. Uh, on the Mersey up there opposite Liverpool. There were good years here because um, not long after I arrived, the Beatles had their first big hit and uh, Liverpool, which is just across the water there, uh, became the centre of the English-speaking world almost for a couple of years. One of the first things I wrote here in Birkenhead um, in the boarding house was The Year of the Foxes. Uh, and it's always seemed to me to be not only one of the p poems that um, touches on most things in my writing, but also taught me a lot about how poems come into existence and how writing occurs. Uh, there was, we used to have to come down to, to tea each night. I was up in the attic at six o'clock and above the stairs there was a head of a fox. I must have passed that a hundred times and it had done nothing to me. And one night I was rushing down those stairs and looked at it and suddenly a whole uh, wedge of my early life came back to me in a flash just like that. When I was 10, my mother, having sold her old fox fur, decided there was money to be made from foxes. And Brisbane ladies, rather the worse for war, drove up in taxis wearing a GI on their arm and rang at our front door. I slept across the hall at night hearing their thin, cold cry. I dreamed the dangerous spark of their eyes, brushes of flame in our far-hung nomadic tent in the suburbs. The dark fox stink of them cornered in their holes and turning. Among my mother's showpieces, Noritake teacups, tall hock glasses with stems like barley sugar, gold leaf demi-tasses, the foxes, row upon row, thin-nosed, prick-eared, dead. 
The thing I found really striking about that was that all the stuff that I remembered for the poem was stuff that can't have come into my head for maybe 20 years. And just at the moment when that uh, image set it off, everything was there, everything I needed. All the details of the, the pictures of the house, uh, all the objects, everything was, came there complete. Family, that too was a kind of place, a place in time. Turn your back and walk away from that and you lost all hold on the line of things. The line was blood. Turn your back on your family and you drain the blood from your heart. Malouf's father died in 1964 and he returned to Brisbane to be with his mother and sister. While cleaning out his father's desk, he discovered an old school magazine which was the spark for his novel, Jono. I let the pages fly under my thumb and was about to consign it to the pile of junk behind the door when out of a pyramid of regular black and white faces I was pulled up short by a familiar, unfamiliar smile. I turned back to the photograph and stared. It was Jono. It was a, a, a real friendship that I was writing about. And um, certainly in the writing, I gave a lot of my own actual characteristics to the Jono character and created a more uh, conservative and conformist narrator than I actually am. Uh, and, and that was part of the necessity of the book. But I also wanted to keep pushing on to ask what it is in um, that friendship um, that, is, that is something um, unspoken, that is not going to be acted out, but that is always part of the pressure of the friendship. And that is a kind of, um, that is a kind of love, although one of the problems is that we, we just don't have enough words to, um, to cover all the gradations of feeling. And so I, I, I hope when that letter comes along that the really shocking four-letter word in it is love. Dante, please, please come. Or we could go to Stradbroke for the weekend. Why don't you ever listen to what I say to you? I've spent years writing letters to you and you never answer, even when you write back. I've loved you and you've never given a fuck for me except as a character in one of your funny stories. Now, for Christ's sake, write to me. Answer me, you bastard. And please come. Love, Jono. I've always been interested in the kind of codes that exist um, in the male world of work or play. And, you know, men spent an awful lot of their lives with one another. And in that world, there's a very, very complex code uh, which allows men to uh, offer one another whatever solidarity or loyalty uh, or affection or understanding is needed uh, without its ever being mistaken for, um, say, sexual interest. crawled with him into that dark, musty, dark-smelling place. And did a thing he could not for his life done a week, perhaps even an hour ago. He sat huddled close to him in the dark, and when he shivered, drew him closer, pulled the old moth-eaten blanket round the two of them, and with the man against him, heard his juddering breath and smelt it while outside moonlight fell on the cleared space round the hut where his wife and children waited. A lot of my writing is really about inner states, and that means states of consciousness which have somehow been imbued with, with passionate feeling. And uh, I'm as likely to 
choose a description of light and weather uh, or landscape as another way of, of expressing that. And so often there's a description of landscape or of, or of an event in a landscape which is uh, very sensual, created in terms of passionate feeling, uh, or as people tell me, uh, of erotic feeling. I am a pool of water. I lie on the dark of the forest waiting for the moon, and softly nearby there are footsteps. A deer. The animal's face leans towards me. Its tongue touches the surface of me, lapping a little. Part of me enters the deer, which lifts its head slowly and moves away over the leaves. Another footfall, softer than the first. I know already it is the child. I see him standing taller than the deer against the stars. He kneels, he stoops towards me. He does not lap like the deer, but leaning close so that his breath shivers my surface, he scoops up a handful, starlight dripping from his fingers in bright flakes that tumble towards me, and drinks. I am broken again. The disturbance is fearful, a noisy crashing of waves against the edges of me. And when I settle, he is gone. Poetry is always deceptive in when it says I, um, we always assume, and we f feel it's part of the, um, the integrity of the poem, is that uh, that I and all its feelings should be absolutely genuine. Now they are because they've got into the writing, but I think the writing of poetry itself um, leads you to express more than you felt, uh, to, exp to express um, something that the poem demands rather than what actually happened. easier after a time to speak of what we share together as four rooms and a garden plot where all the weeds in seven counties congregate. Toothbrushes, red and black. Your muddy wellingtons among egg boxes and daffodil bulbs in the dark of kitchen cupboards your thinness in my shirts. Easier, I mean, than to speak of what we share beyond all this. Night journeys hand in hand across distances like Russia, touching down to find pale sunstalks in our bed. After he published his first two novels, Malouf bought a cottage in the tiny village of Campagnatico in Tuscany, where he's lived and worked for five or six months of every year since 1975. go somewhere where I could sit down and find out what I had to write. Um, without any watches and um, without having to listen to all the, the babble about what I did and what I could do and what I couldn't do. This is a um, very uh, remote part of Tuscany really and certainly when I came here 18 nearly 20 years ago it was pretty unknown and pretty untouched. It's, uh, it's a place in Italy where the past is very close to the surface of the present um, and I quite like that 
um, sense you have of going in and out of focus between the present and the past. The house was owned by um, uh, a woman who was then quite old. She was 78, 79, and this had been her family house. And I bought it and really acquired Agatina with the house. I, she then became my... Um, my patron really in the village, but also somebody to whom I uh, owed a kind of um, obligation. And that, um, that sort of s obligation has increased over the years. I mean, I, it's now difficult for me to be here and not to see her at least once a day. And, um, and I mean, she's the most extraordinary character. She's now 94. Commesso. She's now the um, oldest woman in the village. She was always, I think, one of the most powerful. But I think people are quite scared of her, actually. <laughs> She's a most um, wonderfully articulate old woman and um, very wise and very wicked in lots of ways, full of fun. a Latina, penso. A Latina. No. I, I know almost everything about everybody in this village because she's told me about it. Things that, um, that I don't think she'd tell anybody else because um, she thinks, because Italian is not quite my language, I'm not going to sort of spill the beans. Ma in questo momento sta Poggio Madonna. E qui? Sì, sì, sì. Brutto birbone, sì, 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 ci fa vedere. Sì, sì. Well, we've become very close over these years. I think she, she's never had any children, which is a great um, um, distress to her. And um, in some ways, coming along very late, she sort of acquired me as a sort of grown up, almost grown old um, son. È il miscitino, <laughs> detto proprio nel nostro paese, cittino. <laughs> what I like about being here is that it's, um, it's a quiet place to work. That's the most important thing. When you're writing, really, you're writing out of your head. And wherever you're... You know, your head can be anywhere. I mean, you can be sitting in the house here, but your head can be in Sydney or Brisbane here and now, or 40 years ago. life in Sydney uh, towards the end of 1976. It's a couple of years before I came to live in uh, Campagnatico. Uh, it's about the last years of the life of Ovid, the Roman poet. Um, Ovid was born in Sulmona uh, and uh, I've never been there. It's a place I had to imagine and I've always been rather suspicious, superstitious about uh, going and looking at it. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see a place that you've already imagined, already written about, as if you had been there. Um, I suppose not to test the reality of it, but just as a piece of curiosity at this late stage. <coughs> Ovid's the big name of this town. We've already passed the Ovid supermarket and the 
Ovid, a confetti factory. Um, so virtually everything that people discover here is attributed to Ovid in some kind of way. He was always a source of legends. Have you heard my name, Ovid? Am I still known? Has some line of my writing escaped the banning of my books from all the libraries and their public burning? My expulsion from the Latin tongue? Has some secret admirer kept one of my poems and preserved it or committed it to memory? Do my lines still pass secretly somewhere from mouth to mouth? Has some phrase of mine slipped through as a quotation, unnoticed by the authorities in another man's poem? Or in a letter? Or in a saying that has become part of common speech and cannot now be eradicated? Have I survived? It's hard to imagine that a poet as uh, sophisticated and as decadent as Ovid ever, ever came from a place as wild as this. Um, he must have been very, very glad to get away to Rome. And I can't imagine he ever, ever came back. I, I dare say um, I might have had a different notion of him if I'd seen this before. But uh, I'm not sure it would have made the book any different or better. You know, Italy is a magical word, and Tuscany is even more magical. And so people think of this as a very romantic place. I see a lot of people, especially the English, who uh, come here often to retire, thinking it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be sunny all the time, and uh, there's good wine, and they can sit out in the sun in the winter and all the rest of it. And uh, they pretty quickly get quite discontented. Italians don't do things the way they want them done. And then they find themselves caught. They either can't sell the, the house they've bought, and uh, so they sort of sit around here complaining. I've got a lot of um, um, people I know no, who live around here. Giuseppe. They're mostly, um, they're mostly foreigners. <laughs> and uh, it's a quite cohesive little society, some ways very incestuous and very gossipy, uh, but it's also quite sustaining. I mean, people do look out for one another and look after one another, which is quite nice. The Homo sapiens is still about the same. That's not true. You don't think It's so. not true. But when you say it turns to sort of diminish your ego, it is your ord. No, no, it just means that you don't seem to be all that important. I can imagine that very clearly. It's the same with no, nature. No, I don't huge, you can huge. imagine that at all, Carlos. You can't imagine it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Malouf has decided to put his cottage in Tuscany on the market. After 40 years, he now wants to spend most of his time living in Australia. Where I feel most of the time these days is in Sydney. You know, I've lived there for a long time. Um, I have a lot of friends there. The routine of my life there suits me. It's a city that offers a great deal. I can't imagine a more terrific place to live than Sydney. All, what we have to do is to wet this tree so we can get this out. Here, David, look, look. Put it in there, but very, very carefully. Don't press it. Now, you put all the, look, you put all the soil around it. That's the boy. Now, My niece, uh, Leah, has two little boys, four and two. Push all this water down. Push all the soil. I get my hands dirty. <laughs> Not your bad And uh, one of the things they're quite interested in is plants. And, um, but m I think particularly worms. 
And so they like to come to my garden and we, we dig around a bit and put some plants in and they usually look for, for a worm. I think we, we find the same worm every time, actually. We usually go to the same spot of the garden and put the fork in and uh, turn it up and I think there's the same little worm there saying, you know, no, not again, not this lot. <laughs> what do you think about this, David? Mm -hmm. Hmm? No, I think that's the roots of the tree. That's the roots of the tree. No, it isn't. It isn't. isn't it? No, it's a worm. Do you think it's a worm? Yeah. Uh... Now, David, you're going to dig a little bit, but very, very, very carefully. The beetroot ones, but wonderful. Take the pink ones. Beetroot. Beetroot. Use that Turkish bread stuff. I don't think I myself feel any differently about Australia. Um, now than the way I might have felt 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I mean, Australia has changed in that time. It's become a more complex and richer place. And I was wearing this wonderful um, Gucci tie with tulips on it. And Margaret Ollie said to me, what do you got there on your tie? They look like coconuts. <laughs> I'm uh, these days rather impatient with all the uh, talk we get in Australia about identity. The people used to come. Most of us don't need a national identity. We've got a personal identity. And um, we have relationships with the people we live with, people who live around us, with the neighbourhood. And that's really what sustains people's lives. Oh, She's married to another artist called Mark. If we have to talk about what we share uh, when we're speaking of all the people who live on this continent, then uh, there are all the things that ever happened to us. Um, but most of all, I'd want to say it's the language we speak. An odour of tropical despair hung over the place. The silver dollar in the Texas tavern were still there. So were the strip joints, the skin flick movie houses, the pinball arcades, the fast food shops, the fortune tellers with their little velvet covered tables and tarot packs. And at every corner, the loungers, the lookers, the dealers in this drug and that. And round and behind, in an alley full of garbage, only some of it crammed into plastic bags. The bloody syringes and other evidence with the bodies themselves on occasion. Girls in boots and tights, some of whom were no longer girls either, and some of them not quite girls. And in the park around the fountain, or in the bar at the Rex, the boys in T-shirts and parachute pants. When we came here, we didn't have to come to the continent and bring a culture here. It was already here. I mean, legal ownership doesn't give you possession. What gives you possession finally is taking it into your consciousness in some kind of way, possessing it imaginatively. And I think that's the only way in which we can possess anything in the world, any object, um, any, any piece of land. And uh, uh, in some ways, it's, it's one of the things we might learn by looking at the Aboriginal world, for example. Um, if we speak of them as possessing Australia in a way which we don't quite yet possess it, uh, it is because they've invested every uh, acre of it with meaning in a kind of way, because they've taken every rock and stream and all the, the phenomena of the place into their consciousness. The land was his mother, the only one he had ever known. It belonged to him as he did to it, not by birth, but by second birth, by gift, and not just for his lifetime either, but for the whole of time since it was for the whole of time that it existed, as he did too, so long as he was one with it. This was what the blacks had brought him in case he needed it.
you want a long period when you're distracted by nothing, it's an ideal place. It's a place where you can come and be absolutely isolated. I can come here and um, sit for as many days or weeks as I want and see absolutely nobody. I love the light up here, which is different from anywhere else. And uh, I find it a very relaxing place, but also a place that settles me. I can see that I'll spend a lot more time here. Of course, anything can uh, start a novel. It might be some little bit of conversation you overhear. Uh, it might be a paragraph you read in the, news the newspaper. And something in that has connected with something in you. I never attempted to plan a book in advance. I often uh, know what the very last couple of pages are going to be. And it's a question then of um, finding how you get from, from the beginning to that particular ending. But planning the whole book is not something I've ever done. And I love it when I think the book is going one way and the characters grab you and take you a quite different way. And um, uh, that's, that's exciting to me as a writer and you assume that it's also exciting to a reader. The conditions that are on our life are always uh, temperament and then accident and luck. But there is also another quality we have which is imagination and uh, fiction of is something that believes absolutely in the capacity of the imagination to make the world. All the things that now make us human are things that we've pushed towards and discovered, first of all imagined and then made happen. We are moving, all of us, in our common humankind through the forms we love so deeply in one another to what our hands have already touched in lovemaking and our bodies strain towards in each other's darkness. Slowly and with pain over centuries, we each move an infinitesimal space towards it. We are creating the lineaments of some final man for whose delight we have prepared a landscape and who can only be God. <laughs>